Good to see you this evening. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's open our Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, and verse 12. A lot of people that watch us on, online say, how come you guys don't, how come you don't pray before you start? And what they don't see is that Rob already prayed earlier. Amen? Yes. All right. I just don't want people out there to think we've lost our progressive sanctification or something. <laughs> so we still believe in praying at the beginning. It's just it happened this time off camera. The Bible doesn't say you have to pray with the camera on, does it? Okay, not, not that I'm aware of. And it doesn't say you can't pray without the camera on either. So it's one of those Christian liberty things, amen? All right. Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Zechariah, chapter 1 and verse 12. And um, as we're kind of working our way verse by verse through the book of Zechariah, I decided to entitle this, um, God Keeps a Record. So we are continuing on with our study in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is a prophet who showed up at a particular time in Israel's history to convince the crowd that had just come out of the Babylonian captivity to get busy um, building the temple. So Nebuchadnezzar had essentially destroyed the temple in 586 B.C., and now that they had come out of the captivity, the temple wasn't being built. They had started a little bit, but got discouraged because of opposition. And so God raises up Zechariah, and his primary message is to um, compel the returnees from Babylon to rebuild the temple. So the book of Zechariah has four parts to it, as we've looked at. Number one, there is an introductory call to repentance, verses one through six. God uses clean vessels. And so when he calls us to do anything, if there's personal sins in our lives, you know, he typically calls us to repent of those sins. So that's what you have going on in chapter one, verses one through six. And then Zechariah goes to sleep one night, and as he's sleeping, he receives eight night visions. I mean, I have a hard time remembering a single dream of mine, let alone eight, and then remembering it so well that I wrote about it. So Zechariah receives from the Lord eight night visions, and these are recorded in chapter 1, verse 7 through roughly the end of chapter 6. And each of the visions is designed to uh, compel, to communicate to the returnees from Babylon <clears throat> to get busy rebuilding the temple. So the first vision is the rider amongst the myrtle trees, chapter 1, verses 7 through 17. And we just barely, if I remember right, started looking at that one last time. So as we're moving through these, I'm going to make reference to this chart here. This comes from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. I think the author of that section in the Bible Knowledge Commentary is a man named Dwayne Lindsay. And I like this uh, chart because it gives you the vision, where it's found, and just a one-sentence meaning of the vision. So when you study material like this, it's easy to get interested in all the little details 
that you forget the central point of the vision. So I don't mind looking at all the details, but we don't want to get so busy straining at the veins on the leaves of the trees that we forget what the forest looks like. So people are already doing this. So can somebody magically turn the air on? I know we have some kind of ability to do that. Are you guys warm? You're always warm. I, I run warm too. So I don't know who has the magic buttons anymore, but uh, Casey does, okay. So she can... Um... Oh, she's not allowed, we're not allowed to know who has the magic buttons? Uh, all right. So she's, she, somebody back there is going to be working on it. How's that? So you have the writer amongst the myrtle trees, chapter 1, verses 7 through 17. And the basic point of it is God is angry against the nations that are mistreating Israel. And he has every intention of res restoring Israel to blessing one day. So we ventured into that, the rider and horses amongst the myrtle trees. We saw the date, the description, and then from there we moved to an interpretation. Zechariah makes a, asks a question, the interpreting angel gives an answer, an angel of the Lord gives an answer. And you have the writer's report there in chapter 1, verse 11. Let's just look at verse 11 so we can remember what it is this vision is about. So they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the whole earth and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. So this particular vision is the writer is reporting that everything on the earth is peaceful and quiet under Persian rule. Everything seems to be fine except for Israel. Israel is in a ditch. Um, she has no temple, which is a big problem because Jesus... 500 years later, according to Bible prophecy, is going to come to a temple. So it's hard to do that when no temple exists. So Israel has no temple. We know from the book of Nehemiah, which would be written later, <laughs> that Israel had no wall around the city. And in the ancient Near East, when you were a city without a wall, you were very vulnerable and the people had sort of gotten started with these projects, but opposition and setback forced them to abandon these projects, at least the temple project, for at least somewhere between 10 to 15 years. So the point of this vision is everything is going great in the world except for the nation of Israel. And last time we entitled that particular lesson, God's thoughts, because God doesn't think the way most people think. Uh, most people would be very happy just looking at the condition of the world under Persian rule, seeing everything humming along. And most people would look at that and say, everything's great, what do we have to complain about? But God doesn't think the way man thinks. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's thoughts higher than our thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways. So the rest of the world is sort of celebrating how everything is going under Persian rule. But God is not looking at life the way the rest of the world does. He's looking specifically at Israel, his elect nation, and he is seeing her problems. So that takes us to an explanation of this particular night vision. And that's, this is where we pick it up with fresh material today or this evening, verses 12 through 17. And the explanation has, oh, I don't know, about five parts to it. But the first part of it is God 
remains jealous for the city of Jerusalem in spite of all of its problems. So take a look at Zechariah chapter 1, notice verse 12. It says, Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, which you have been indignant Uh, which you have been indignant these 70 years. So the accusation comes against God that, you know, Israel's in a ditch, the rest of the world is doing fine, and God, the problem is you don't really care. You ever felt like that about your circumstances? Uh, God doesn't really, you, you pray to God for an answer, you don't get an immediate answer over some kind of situation going on in your life. And so the quick accusation we raise against God is, well, God, the reason there's inaction is you don't care. So this is sort of the accusation that's brought against God. You don't care. The reason why Jerusalem has no wall and has no temple is you're unconcerned. And in fact, God, you haven't been concerned for 70 years. What 70 years is he talking about? The 70 years of captivity. If you're interested in the 70 years of captivity that they had just emerged from and where that's found in the Bible, you could jot down a couple of verses. One is Jeremiah 25 verse 11. Jeremiah, prior to the Babylonian captivity, predicted that Israel would go into captivity for exactly 70 years. So they went from the land of Israel about 300 to 350 miles to the east, essentially to modern day Iraq, and there they were in captivity for 70 years. So that number 70 years that you see there in verse 12, you'll find it in Jeremiah 25 verse 11. You'll also find that number predicted by Jeremiah before it happened in Jeremiah 29 verse 10. Now most Bible readers understand that they went into captivity for 70 years. Very few people, even though it's sort of obvious when I'll explain it, very few people understand why they went into captivity for 70 years. I mean, why not 68 years? Why not 73 years? Why exactly 70 years? Because as you look at verse 12, you see the figure 70 years. God, you haven't been concerned about us for 70 years. The reason why they went into captivity for 70 years is found in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 21 and 22, where it says on the eve of the captivity into Babylon, it says to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. I just read to you or showed you those two places in Jeremiah's prophecies where Jeremiah predicted a 70-year captivity. It goes on in 2 Chronicles 36 verses 21 and 22 and it says, until the land enjoyed its Sabbaths. Did you catch that? It says, all the days of desolation it kept the Sabbath until the 70 years were completed. Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing. So immediately when the 70-year figure was met, God stirred up Cyrus, the king of Persia, who allowed Israel to return from Babylon back to the land of Israel. And this is largely where the book of Zechariah is taking place. So why 70 years? Well, it tells you right there in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, until um, the Sabbaths were completed. 
Now, this goes back to the Mosaic Law. And early on in Leviticus 26, I want to say it's about verses 1 through 7. God told the Jews, you're going to work six days and you're going to rest on the Sabbath. That's the Israeli work week. Uh, You'll find that in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. But in Leviticus 26, God says that same principle holds true for the land. You are to work the land for six years. And on the seventh year, you are to not work the land, and you are to allow the land to have a rest. So the nation of Israel, you know, essentially what they did is they said, um, God, we're not going to do things your way. We're going to reject your Sabbath principle. So I know you told us to to work the land six years and let it have a rest on the seventh year. Well, we're not going to do that. And so there were 70 Sabbath years in that cycle of disobedience where the nation of Israel did not do what God said. And because they ignored what God said for 70 Sabbath years, God says, okay, um, I'm going to actually kick you out of the land for 70 years. And as you're kicked out of the land for 70 years, we're going to make up for those 70 Sabbaths that you trampled on. So there were apparently in this cycle 70 years where the nation of Israel basically thumbed its nose at God. They probably somehow thought that they were getting away with something. And God says, no, I'm keeping a record. I'm keeping a record of every year you violated my Sabbath principle. And you violated my Sabbath principle for 70 years. And so I'm going to kick you out of the land for 70 years. So that the land can have its rest. So that's where that 70 year uh, figure comes from. That's why they went into captivity for exactly 70 years. One of the things to understand about God is he works in complete numbers. He's very precise. For example, this may interest you. On the very day that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in 586 B.C. to the exact day is the exact same day when Titus of Rome in A.D. 70, over six centuries later, um, destroyed the temple on that exact same day. So God allowed Israel to be disciplined in terms of the destruction of her temple on a specific day This happened in 586 B.C. It also happened in A.D. 70. And this was kind of worked into, over the course of time, the Israeli calendar. One of her days where she's commemorating the destroyed temple. And anybody that knows anything about Jewish history and Jewish tradition and the Mishnah and the Talmud will tell you that there are things in those documents where God dealt with the temple issue in A.D. 70 on the exact same day that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in 586 B.C. So you look at that and you say, wow, God's a God of precision. Calculations, math, (laughs) and things like that are very important to God. And so that's why they went into captivity for 70 years, 70 years, and that's why it's being referenced there in verse 12, and so the accusation has come against God that for these 70 years, Lord, you just haven't cared. Which is a silly accusation when you think about it. But when you drop down to verse 13, you see the Lord's answer. The Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me, and I love this right here, with gracious words and comforting words. One of the things to understand about God is God is a God of grace. This is a picture, an artist's rendition of what John saw on the island of Patmos in AD 95, Revelation chapter 1. 
and it looked exactly like that because I found this on the internet, so it must be true. (laughs) But he describes Jesus coming to him and John was the one, you remember, who leaned against Christ's chest in the upper room about 60 years earlier. You'll see that in John 13 and verse 23. Um, And so now Jesus shows up to John on the island of Patmos in his glorified state in AD 95. And John is scared out of his mind. So what does Jesus do to John who is in a terrified state? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. It says, He placed his right hand on me, John is writing, saying, Do not be afraid. Doesn't that fit with what we're reading here? Gracious and comforting words. John is terrified, seeing Jesus in his glorified state. Jesus puts his hand on John and says, do not be afraid. That's the same kind of thing that's happening here in verse 13. A ridiculous accusation is raised against God. God, you haven't cared for 70 years. And how does God answer? Not with harshness, not with retribution, but with gracious and comforting words. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3 says this. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, exhortation, and consolation. Consolation is comfort. God, through the gift of prophecy, is in the business of comforting his people. So when you start to study this and understand it, then you begin to understand why there's so much in the Bible about having our speech seasoned and not being filled with wrath and retribution and accusation and venom because when God speaks he speaks with grace and we need to be people that speak the same way amen Uh, the book of Ephesians says that we should speak the truth in love speaking the truth is easy but doing it in love is a little bit more Difficult. Wouldn't you agree with me on that? When 1 Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3 verse 15 to give a defense for the hope that lies within us, defense is apologia, or to be defenders of the faith, it tells us to do it with gentleness and respect. So our goal in defending the faith is not to beat people so far into the ground that they'll never see the light of day again, but it's to speak with words of grace. And so that's what's spoken of here in verse 13. This ridiculous accusation is raised against God. God, you haven't cared about Jerusalem for 70 years. And God's response is not venom and harshness in tone, but it's speaking with grace and comforting words. Charles Feinberg describes the comforting words that are going to come when he says the good comforting words yet before us in verses 14 through 17 are threefold. Number one, God still loves Jerusalem. Number two, he is exceedingly angry with the nations that have afflicted Israel. And number three, he has purposes of glory prosperity and enlargement for Jerusalem. So with that being said, we drop down to verse 14. And it says, so the angel who was speaking with me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. So God, you haven't cared about Jerusalem for 70 years. And God says, nonsense. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem. So just when you think God doesn't care, he speaks up and he says, I do care. Uh, I care 
exceedingly. So God always has his eye on Jerusalem. It was David back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, over five centuries before this was written, that made the city of Jerusalem a, the Jewish capital. God has always cared about Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a very special role in the outworking of God's purposes. Jerusalem has a future. And so this is part of the gracious and comforting words that God is now revealing in the midst of what seems to be a very harsh accusation. God, you haven't cared about Jerusalem for 70 years. God says, I do care. In fact, I'm not just jealous for it. But if you look at verse 14, it says, I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem. So the rest of the world's running fine, but Israel is in a ditch. No wall, no temple. Well, God, I guess you just don't care. The first response is, God is exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem. God cares even though it appears that he doesn't care because of inaction. And then you go down to verse 15 where we have a description that God not only is exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem, but he's actually angry with the nations that are at ease that have persecuted Jerusalem. So take a look there at verse 15, Zechariah chapter 1. It says, but I was very angry with the nations who are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. So very angry parallels with very jealous. Just as God is very jealous for Jerusalem, he's very angry at the nations these past 70 years that have mistreated Jerusalem. And he's angry at these pagan nations because they are at ease. We know they are at ease because of what it said back in chapter 1, verse 11. We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. It seems like Persia is just doing fine. But the problem is God is angry with Persia, just like he was angry with Babylon, because they have actually resisted God's purposes for the city of Jerusalem. It's kind of interesting as you go through the Bible that... God is angry with people that are at ease to the point where they see no need for him in their lives. Amos chapter 4 and verse 1 says this, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. And he's speaking to women when he says that. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who exploit the poor, who oppress the needy, and say to their husbands, bring now that we may drink. So these were people that became very wealthy by oppressing others. And they were, as they were oppressing others, they were saying to their husbands, oh yeah, go get me a, a, a strawberry daiquiri, please. That's a loose translation, of course. And Amos essentially describes them as cows of Bashan. It's like a giant cow just kind of rolling over somebody. Totally unconcerned, you know, with um, the well-being of somebody. The only thing they care about is their own personal prosperity and their own personal well-being. And so it's interesting as you look there at verse 15, God expresses anger at the nations that are at ease. The world is running very, very nicely under Persian control. The nations are at ease, but Israel is suffering. And so God is upset with these nations that are at ease while his people are suffering. The nations oppressing Israel are described in the book of Daniel as a giant statue Head of gold would represent Babylon. Chest and arms of silver would represent the empire that we are looking at here, Medo-Persia. The uh, belly and thighs of bronze would represent Greece, yet future. And the legs of iron would represent Rome. Rome. 
there was an eastern division of Rome and a western division of Rome. That's probably what's meant there by the two legs of iron. And then the feet of iron mixed with clay would represent the Antichrist empire. And it's interesting that in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar is the one that saw that vision. And to him, it looked like a beautiful, dazzling statue because he was on top. He was the one oppressing as the leader of Babylon. But when Daniel sees the exact same concept in a vision in Daniel 7, you get the Jewish perspective where it's no longer a beautiful, dazzling statue, but rather it's four disgusting, ferocious beasts. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and a terrifying beast. Lion would correlate with the head of gold. The bear would correlate with the chest and arms of silver. The leopard would correlate with the belly and thighs of bronze. The terrifying and frightening beast would correlate with the legs of iron. So is it a wonderful time or is it a difficult time? It depends on who you ask. If you get the Gentile perspective, it seems beautiful, Daniel 2. If you get the Jewish perspective, it seems terrible, Daniel chapter 7. So the very nations that, that believe that they are on top of the world and are, are oppressing the nation of Israel, what we learn here is God actually views them as disgusting, grotesque animals. And God is keeping a record of how they are oppressing his people. So you look there at Zechariah chapter 1 verse 15 and God says, just as I was exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem, verse 15, he doesn't just say I was angry, but I was very angry with the nations who are at ease. So the goal of preaching is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Right, And that's what's happening here with Zechariah. He is comforting God's people in their endeavor to rebuild the temple. But he is afflicting the comfortable by reminding the nations who think that they are on top of the world. Who are oppressing Israel that God is very angry with them. And then you look down at the second part of verse 15 and it says, and this is very interesting, it says, for while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. So God says I was a little angry, but these nations furthered the disaster, meaning what? I like what Charles Ryrie says here. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 15, they furthered the disaster. Literally, they helped for evil. Though the heathen nations were used of God to punish Israel, they went too far by trying to annihilate her. So God raised up Babylon to bring the nation of Israel into captivity. But then Babylon went too far in oppressing God's people. Uh, they oppressed God's people beyond God's original design. So God got angry at Babylon and raised up the Persians to overthrow the Babylonians. And now the Persians are in power. And God used the Persians again to bring the nation of Israel out of the exile and to discipline God's people. But now the Persians have gone too far. So God is angry with the Persians. And later on in history, he's going to raise up Greece to overthrow Persia. And the same pattern is going to be replicated with Greece. God is going to use Greece to discipline his people, but Greece is going to go too far. And so God is going to raise up Rome to overthrow Greece. And then God will use Rome to discipline his people, but the Romans are going to go too far. So God will ultimately overthrow Rome, a revived Rome of the Antichrist through the coming of his kingdom. So I couldn't find a better explanation of this than God keeps a record. Um, Charles Feinberg says this, they helped, that's the nations, with evil purpose to exterminate them. <laughs> 
God meant a moderate punishment, but the Babylonians and the others reveled in the sufferings of Israel with delight in prolonging them. Babylon, like Assyria, was the rod of God's wrath, but their own hearts were designed, their own hearts designed evil against Israel. Note, it is an unfailing scriptural principle. God's relations to Israel are one thing, and the relations of the nations to Israel are another. God is never pleased with the meddling of strangers in his relations with Israel. It is as though a father were chastening a child and a stranger began to punish with an iron rod. Some take refuge in the plea that God has predicted these things beforehand. True, but the prediction of the sufferings of Christ and his betrayal at the hands of his own familiar friend mitigated not one whit the crime of the Romans and Israel, or for that matter, Judas Iscariot. So when the nations that God had originally raised up to discipline his people became cruel and went outside of the box that God had given them, God kept a record of that and he marked them for destruction the moment they went too far in discipline. And so Charles Feinberg's point is, well, you know, this was all predicted in Bible prophecy. But who cares? Judas's betrayal of Christ is predicted in Bible prophecy. But that didn't lower Jew Judas's crime, according to Feinberg here, one whit. So all of this is the outworking of what we were looking at on Sunday mornings. In Genesis 12, where God brought the nation of Israel into existence and he gave Israel certain promises. And one of the promises that he gave to Israel is the one who curses you, I will curse. So even the nations that God raised up to discipline his people, when those nations go too far, God keeps a record of that and marks those nations for destruction. So you could see how understanding this would be an encouragement to the beleaguered returnees as they were trying to rebuild the temple but being resisted to some extent by the Persian Empire. God is saying I'm keeping a record of what the Persian Empire is doing to you. And I'm going to mark the Persian Empire for destruction. They're going to fall at the hands of the Greeks uh, a few centuries down the road. So I guess I could put it this way. Um, let's say God is disciplining you. God is disciplining me. Let's pretend. And his instrument of discipline is a really cruel, mean manager or boss. And God puts you in that circumstance because he wants you to learn a lesson. But then the really mean boss or manager goes too far and actually begins to revel, begins to take glee in how they are mistreating you. And God says the days of that cruel boss or manager are numbered because that boss or manager went beyond the disciplinary model that I had originally ordained for them. That's the kind of thing that's happening here in the book of Zechariah. And as the beleaguered returnees are struggling sometimes against the Persian Empire itself to rebuild the temple, God is saying don't get too worked up about that because the moment Persia goes too far is the moment I'm going to take a note of that and the days of Persia will be um, numbered at that point. So God is jealous for Jerusalem, verses 12 through 14. God is angry with the nations that are persecuting the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem, verse 15. And then as you move into verses 16 and 17, 
you start to see that God has every intent to restore Jerusalem to its place of prominence. So notice, if you will, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. So here is Jerusalem without a temple and without a wall. They're completely vulnerable. The exiles and the returnees are somewhat beleaguered in their assignment to rebuild the temple. And you could see how discouragement would set in. And the first thing God says here is you ought to get busy rebuilding Jerusalem and you ought to get busy rebuilding the temple because it's my intention to prosper Jerusalem again. So don't you want to be on the front end of that equation? If you obey me here, um, you're going to put into motion a process that ultimately down the road is going to lead to the prosperity of the city of Jerusalem. And this is where you start getting prophecies about the millennial kingdom. Charles Feinberg says, but if God's words can comfort the then present generation and speak for messianic times to come, as in multiplied numbers of passages, who shall say this is contrary to his practice? We need not limit the Holy One of Israel. This is not to say that we find no fulfillment in that time, but this does not exhaust the prophecy there awaits a fuller fulfillment. And this is part of the way how Zechariah does his ministry. He doesn't just talk about the time period that the audience was in. He does make reference to that, but he talks about the end game. He talks about God's big plans. And he is using that as an incentive to get them moving in the right direction. Don't you want to take a, a baby step in the right direction and be the initial part of a plan that will culminate one day in the millennial kingdom? Feinberg goes on and he says, these prophecies will be completely fulfilled in the return of Israel to her land in messianic times. A return of which the restoration from the Babylonian captivity was only a pledge and a promise. See, their, their return from Babylon was a big deal, but that's just a down payment on greater things to come. If you put a down payment on something, you're guaranteeing to the seller that further payments are coming. So God did a great work in bringing them back into their land, which was wonderful. And he's saying to them, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because I'm going to keep working and working and working until all of these promises that I'm giving you are going to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. Feinberg goes on and he says, space would not forbid of bringing forth the many passages concerning the messianic reign which predict the presence of God's mercy in Jerusalem, the building of his temple. See, he's giving here a bunch of millennial prophecies. The rebuilding of Jerusalem, the prosperity of Judah's cities, the comfort of Zion, the composite picture is without a doubt um, messianic. So get busy, folks, with the temple and get busy with Jerusalem because I've got big plans for it. It's like you have a kid, you know, and you look at this kid and you say, man, this kid's never going to go anywhere. And yet I'm pouring all my effort and energy into this kid. And then all of a sudden, God shows you a vision of that kid becoming president of the United States. And you had no idea that that was part of the plan. And you're so overwhelmed by that that now the process of discipline, the process of homeschooling, if you're involved in that, 
the process of rearing a child, suddenly you've got brand new incentive to do it because God just showed you the end game. And he says to you, take some baby steps of obedience now because you have no idea what I'm going to do in this child's life. That is sort of the equivalent of what Zechariah is revealing here to these returnees. Um, Big plans God has for the city of Jerusalem. In fact, Zechariah 14, which we'll eventually get to, indicates that Jesus is going to run the whole world one day from the city of Jerusalem. Isaiah 2 verse 3 says, The law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So if that's true, you ought to be zealous for Jerusalem and you ought to resist discouragement and you ought to get involved in rebuilding the city, rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the temple. In fact, when Satan is led out of the abyss at the end of the thousand-year kingdom, Revelation 20 verse 9 indicates that Satan will attack the city of Jerusalem or the beloved city. Because Satan himself knows that Jerusalem is going to be the central headquarters of the millennial kingdom. Robert Thomas says at the end of the millennium, that's, that city, Jerusalem, will be Satan's prime objective with his rebel army because Israel will be leader again among the nations. God has big plans for Jerusalem and he has big plans for the temple. And so resist discouragement and get to work on the city and get to work on the temple now is Zechariah's whole point in bringing up under the power of the Holy Spirit all of these millennial prophecies. So God, you just haven't cared for 70 years. God says nonsense. I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem, verses 12 through 14. I'm also very angry with the nations that have gone too far and discipline my people beyond what I ordained, verse 15. And in fact, I'm going to restore Jerusalem fully one day, first part of verse 16. And then the second part of verse 16 is the temple itself is going to be restored. This is what they all didn't want to do because of discouragement. They didn't want to get busy rebuilding the temple. And God says, you better get busy because there's got to be a temple for Jesus to come to to fulfill messianic prophecy, number one. And number two, there's going to be a functioning temple in the millennial kingdom. So look at the second part of verse 16. My house, see the word house there? That's a reference to what? The temple. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. So when he says my house will be rebuilt, What house is he speaking of? I think he's speaking of there the temple number four in Israel's history, the millennial temple. So Israel in her history has four temples. Temple number one was built by Solomon and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. That was the temple that was dormant for the 70 years of captivity. Temple number two is, is on the precipice of being rebuilt by this crowd here in the book of Zechariah as they came back from the 70 years of captivity. That would be the temple that would be functioning in the life of Jesus Christ. All the way through Christ's ministry, he's interacting with temple number two. As a youth, he was taken into the temple, you remember, I think he was 12, and he was confounding the religious leaders with his wisdom. That's temple two. Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and said, throw yourself off and the angels will catch you. That's temple number two. That's got to be up and running or messianic prophecy can't be fulfilled. We know that that temple was destroyed by the Romans 40 years after the time and life of Christ. It was destroyed by the Romans for disciplinary reasons because the nation of Israel rejected the king 
and their kingdom. There will be, according to Bible prophecy, a third temple, which will be built through nationalistic pride that the Antichrist will desecrate midway through the tribulation period. That third temple, I think, is going to be destroyed in the seventh bowl judgment, Revelation 16, which describes the greatest earthquake in human history at the end of the tribulation. And that destroyed temple will give way to the glorious millennial temple that we read about in Ezekiel 40 through 48, or the Shekinah glory of God that left temple number one prior to the Babylonian captivity will re-enter that millennial temple. And so I think what's happening here is Ezekiel, excuse me, Zechariah, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is giving his audience a vision of temple two and temple four as an incentive to get busy building now because as you take a baby step of obedience, you get the opportunity of being on the front side of God's big, big plans. You know, you shouldn't be building as Haggai says, who was a contemporary of Zechariah. You shouldn't be building your own house while the Lord's house is desolate. That's what Haggai's ministry is saying. Why? Because God has big plans for his temple. And it's going to lead right into the glorious millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So when he says there in verse 16, my house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. That's what he's talking about. And then he says a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. What's the measuring line? The measuring line is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 13, where prior to the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, God said, I will stretch over Jerusalem the line. So the line was representative of destruction that was coming. So when the measuring line is mentioned again, it's representative not of destruction, but of restoration. The same God that, is, that allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed is the same God that is going to allow Jerusalem to be rebuilt. So that's sort of a picture of what that fourth temple is going to look like, Ezekiel 40 through 48. It's going to be much bigger than Herod's temple, temple number two. It's going to be even bigger than Solomon's temple. It's going to be much bigger than the Mosaic Tabernacle. And there's how Temple 4 squares, even in comparison to a modern-day football field. And, you know, you keep in mind that the exiles, what they saw was nothing but rocks thrown everywhere. And the whole assignment just seemed so out of proportion to their abilities. And they probably had almost no idea what God was going to do with their little step of obedience. See, when you take a step of obedience to God, you have no, you have no idea what he's going to do. Remember what Jesus asked the little boy with a few loaves and a few fish? All Jesus asked is to give me your loaves and fish. And the little boy could have said, no, I don't want to do that. But the little boy took a step of obedience. He did exactly what God said. He deposited just the meager loaves and fish in Christ's hands. And Christ, just like that, multiplied it and fed 5,000 people. And I guarantee you that little boy, when he took that little step of obedience, had absolutely no idea what Jesus was going to do. And so this is the same kind of thing that's happening here. 
uh, take a little step of obedience, get busy rebuilding number temple number two, and just watch what I'm going to do with your humble efforts. So God is jealous for Jerusalem. God is angry with the nations. Jerusalem is going to be restored. The temple is going to be restored. And then finally we end tonight with verse 17 where God is going to cause prosperity to come back to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, look, if you will, at verse uh, 17. It says, again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities will again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord again will comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was not prospering at all when this prophecy was given. But God here says, I've got big, big plans for the city of Jerusalem. And this is probably another prophecy that's making predictions about the millennial kingdom. Isaiah 65 verses 21 and 22 says they in the millennial kingdom will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people and my chosen ones will work out, will wear out rather the work of their hands. God has every intention of taking little Jerusalem and restoring it to prosperity. Amos 9 verse 13 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. When the mountains will drip with sweet wine, <clears throat> and all the hills will be dissolved. Can God take Jerusalem and prosper it again? Well, he's doing it right now in our day. And we're not even in the millennial kingdom yet. When Mark Twain went to that part of the world in 1867 and wrote about it two years later in his book called Innocence Abroad, he said in 1867, there's nothing over here but a silent, mournful expanse. 18, that was 1867. Wrote about it in 1869. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. A desolate country, he says, whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds. And look at Jerusalem today. She has a gross domestic product that outstrips that of, of most of her neighbors. I mean, how could that have happened when Mark Twain in 1869 says there's nothing over here but a barren expanse? So we have absolutely no excuse for not believing that God can prosper Jerusalem again as Zechariah is predicting 500 years before the time of Christ because we're watching it happen before our very eyes. Of course God can take this little city and prosper it again. Look at the difference between 19, uh, 1867 and today, 2021. He says there in verse 17... And the Lord will again comfort Zion. This reminds me of Isaiah 40 and verse 1, which says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. God is in the comforting business. Did you know that? He's called the God of all comfort for a reason, because he's in the comforting business. He comforts us in the midst of our afflictions in the midst of our discouragements, which is what this little group of returnees was experiencing. When there, were, there, when there was nothing around but a, a city without a wall that had been broken down and a temple that had been totally destroyed and they could see nothing but rocks strewn everywhere 
from what Nebuchadnezzar had done to it 70 years later. And then they're being resisted by the Persian Empire in terms of rebuilding. You can, you can start to see what these prophecies meant to them. And then he says there in verse 17, and again he will choose Jerusalem. So he will prosper Jerusalem. He will comfort Jerusalem and the Jewish people. And then he says, I'll choose her again. Now, when he says, I'll choose her, he's not saying, I divorced you. You were my city, then I divorced you, and now you're not my city, but one day I'll remarry you. That's not what he's saying. God cannot divorce Jerusalem from himself because of which covenant? It's at the very top there. The Abrahamic covenant, which is unconditional. Genesis 15. So what does it mean when he says, I will again choose Jerusalem? He's not saying the city is going to be mine again. It's always been his. What he's saying is I will choose Jerusalem again for blessing and not adversity. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 13, it says the Lord God will make you, that's Israel, head and not the tail. You will only, you only will be above and not underneath if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I'm commanding you today to follow them carefully. So that takes us to the end of the rider and horses amongst the myrtle trees. And the key point of that first vision is God is angry at the nations and has every intention of blessing restored Israel. And so as this vision has unfolded with the explanation we studied tonight, we see that God is still jealous for Jerusalem even though she's not currently in the place of blessing. God is angry with the nations that are oppressing her even though God is the one that allowed those nations to come into existence to begin with for purposes of discipline. But when the nations go too far, God keeps a record of that. Jerusalem is going to be restored, verse 16. The temple itself is going to be restored. And Jerusalem is going to flourish again with agricultural prosperity. And she is going to be a light to the nations one day. So... That's like telling a parent with a disobedient kid that you're struggling with, hang in there because that kid's going to be president of the United States. Wouldn't that encourage your parenting? I mean, you have no idea what I'm going to do with this kid. So be faithful in your parenting now 